Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very unique improvisational experimental filmmaker. Her name is Linda Yellen. She uh, directed this Showtime movie when I was a kid. I loved so much, I still remember it to this day. Um, it's called Chantilly Lace. And um, I'm having her on the show today. I want to talk about that and basically, you know, how she got started in film and how she developed this improvisational way of uh, filmmaking. And um, she's also uh, produced many TV movies like Mayflower, The Pilgrim's Adventure, Liberace, the 1989 remake of Sweet Bird of Youth, and so many others. And she made um, another movie called Parallel Lives. Another That's another Showtime TV movie. And The Simeon Line. And so many others. And I'm going to have her on today to talk about all of those. And it's going to be great. You know, the last show before Mother's Day weekend. So yeah, here is my interview with Linda Yellen. Hey, Linda. Hi, Tommy. How nice to talk with you. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Well, you know, trying to keep going, getting really tired of this lockdown. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's for our, all our good, I guess, to, to yeah. be safe. Uh, where are you? Where are you locked down? Uh, Redding, California. Oh, well, that sounds nice, right? If you have to be any place, you get to walk around in nature and uh, do your thing a little bit. It's a good place to be quarantined, not a good place to live overall, but I I feel very blessed to, to be here during this strange time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I, I got out of the city and I'm staying in a friend's uh, house in uh, Maplewood, New Jersey, which is not as beautiful as where you are, but it's it's, you know, kind of nice and suburban and... You know, I get the city just became too much. We're hearing all the sirens all the time. Oh. People dying and just, it's just horror. I mean, I guess like being at war with an unseen enemy, everyone has said, you know. Yeah, I could imagine. But, but so I like the idea of turning my attention as we end this week to movies, which is so much better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time today. This is such a great honor. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure, for sure. Uh, you're welcome. So, uh, going back in time, um, did you gravitate toward film early on in your childhood? I absolutely did. Uh, my mother uh, had a great opportunity to be an actress. She was offered an RKO contract. Oh. Um, she was underage at the time. She was, I think, about 17 or 18, I think you had to be 21 to make your own decisions then. And we had one uncle, great uncle, who was a projectionist, who told my grandparents that if they allowed my mother to go, she might become a whore. So <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't let her go, and she became a chemist instead and a housewife and teacher. And But always was madly in love with the movies and started taking me from a very young child. Um, I never believed, because of the feelings, their prejudice about the industry, there would ever be anything that I could actually do. The closest I came to believing I might be in films, uh, you know, as a teenager, uh, I thought maybe I could be a film critic and then get to see all the movies, you know, that I could possibly enjoy. Um, yeah. But then in college, uh, I directed a play... Um, I went to Barnard College, an old woman's college, and I directed a play about the War of the Roses, which was all about the women left behind. And as it turned out, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, my, who was the chairman of the Board of Trustees, showed up uh, opening night and really liked my direction and sort of 
bounced my career um, and uh, said, um, would you like to direct summer theater? Some of my work, and only, I was 16 at the time, you know, only with that naivete, hey, I said, no one goes to the theater. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I told him I was to make a movie, and he, he donated a thousand dollars to Barnard College. I made my first uh, film short, and it won third mm -hmm. prize at the New York Film Festival, and, and, and that's how it all began. Yes, and if I may backtrack, um, though, uh, before we get into all that, uh, do, do you remember the first movie you ever saw? Gosh, no. That, what a great question, and boy, would I love to know it. I'm going to ask my mother if okay. she remembers. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I was taken, you know, I was going to the movies at three, four. Yeah. Well, here's, here's a better version of that question. How about the first movie you saw? that it, t it touched you so much that you were like, I want to be a filmmaker. Mm, wow. Again, uh, I, I may, maybe it's easy because it was a, about a young woman and I sort of identified with her and I would have been about 10 at the time that came out, I think, um, uh, with Leslie Caron and... Uh, Louis Jordan and Marie Chevalier. Mm -hmm. We saw it over again, and it touched me. Probably about the same time, I saw a, a drama. They took me to everything. There, there weren't the same codes. Uh, earlier, there had been the Hayes Code, but you know, when I grew up in the fifties, that wasn't really in play, and they didn't have the ratings that they have today. So, so they wouldn't think about anything taking what normally today people might say. Uh, inappropriate material for a young, you know, child. Yeah. So the nun story with Audrey Hepburn, mm -hmm. no. uh, where a nun loses faith and has to, you know, and decides to leave the conduit. Um, so, you know, so it's a pretty heady fair. I remember that too. But they're both great questions I just can't answer with certainty. Um, I knew uh, I... The time I was in college, uh, and I got to use the banner of being um, a, a journalist for the college newspaper, and I got to meet film directors and interview them. Mm -hmm. By that time, um, it started to seem to me that it was uh, uh, maybe a possibility. And then, you know, the following year, the Richard Rogers first film came about. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what filmmakers influenced you? Oh, I was very, um, at the same time I was at school with Barnard, through an odd situation where my first feature uh, was almost acquired by a company called Cinema 5, which was that the Weinstein brothers, uh, before they were so, uh, you know, disliked and before they even had started their career, yeah. uh, as well as Bob Shea, who headed New Line Cinema. They're all young men and worshiping at the feet of this man, um, Donald Rugoff. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you have a chance, um, I get a chance to see there's a documentary about his career. And he was the first distributor of independent films to really make it big. Huh. And for some odd reason, he chose me to be his film buyer while I was, uh, I think, a junior in college. And I used to get out of classes and say, um, I'm going to Rome, and I can't be in class. Is that Rome, New York? No, Rome, Italy. And um, this, this lasted for two years. And um, I, you know, it was the most exciting time in my life that I had this. I made some good choices to him. But... During the process, I really got to know European filmmaking and European filmmakers, and I uh, identified with them. So Lelouch and Fellini and um, uh, uh, Rossellini and, uh, um, you know, it just was, um, and some of the British uh, directors. It was just, uh, and it was much easier in that, that, at that time to have access. I felt there's so many layers today. If a filmmaker, a budding filmmaker, wants to meet their idols, you know, there's there's fear of what might happen. There are agents, managers.
teenagers. It is just, it's just almost impossible to get just to meet them. Yeah. And it seems a little easier. Yeah, I just, I just thought of a, a question on the spot here. Uh, d- d- uh, are B movies and independent movies the same? No, no. They're a B movie. Um, you know, lots of studios made B movies because of course. B movie being that in general they didn't have as big stars and they or budgets and the content tended to be you know uh, something rather conventional like uh, semi-horror or thriller or, uh, uh, you know, uh, detective, something like that. And it was often a, like a, a training ground for directors who would go on to do more distinguished. So that existed both within the studios and also the independent companies who started making films couldn't compete with the budgets, the higher budgets of studios. So they right. made the big B movies, and as you well know, so many fantastic directors came out of uh, the the Corman's, right? The, right, the Scorsese's like, and the Coppola's and Bogdanovich and James Cameron. I mean, they all came from uh, Corman. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there were other B. I mean, in a way, RPO for was sort of B compared to the studios. You know, yeah. and there were other things like that too. Yeah. It's, but, it, but that, People expected, it's so hard to believe, people expected, I remember this as a child, to be going to a double feature. It's kind of like the A and B sides of a record. Mm-hmm. You know, people would buy a 45 and there'd be two sides to it. And sometimes the, the B side would be the one that you really liked better than the one that made you buy the record. And that would happen with B movies, too. Yeah, because I've always been um, just uh, confused by that whole thing, you know. I mean, I always used to have this joke, and I don't know if it's funny or not, where I would say, you know, what's the difference between a low-budget movie and an independent movie? And it's uh, independent movies are about something, (laughs) you know? (laughs) I think it's a good joke. I, I like it. Thank you, yeah. Because, yeah, because it, it's always been confusing, you know, I mean, because B-movies can be low budget. Right. And, of course, what happened in the latter days of Sundance, I mean, Sundance is still going on, but it's evolving greatly. But in the last 10 years or so, you can't even use that joke because a lot of things that call themselves independent movies were really, uh, really studio movies and with much higher budgets than those of us who've made true independent movies. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that uh, short film you made, Prospera, is, is is that where you 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 cut your teeth finding your um, your distinctive style that you have as an improvisational filmmaker? Oh well, thank you. No, I came shortly after that at the Columbia riots of uh, 1969, mm-hmm. and uh, I was uh, still in school and a junior, I think, and uh, there was this extraordinary access to a camp to film something while all this was going on, and you could only get in to the campus if you were a student. Um, And since there weren't any classes to attend, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, it sort of became an opportunity, and I I filmed, you know, a lot of documentary footage. So it was quite brutal. I actually am in the process of restoring that first film, and it's incredibly innocent. But I'll tell you, Tommy, there's footage there that's still riveting even today because it's just so honest, and it's just obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, happening. Um, and on the, you know, as as I'm filming, and then what happened is the school still, you know, closed, and but things had settled down by summer. And I was able to entice uh, a bunch of my, uh, you know, student actor friends, mm-hmm. including some of the people who were actually writing, you know, two months earlier, to come back and help do um, a drama a- a- around uh, a- a- the footage that we had shot, and that, that was called um, "Come Out, Come Out," and uh, it, so that had uh, many improvisational moments. Um, it also had a 200-page script because I didn't have any idea how long scripts 
<laughs> oh yeah. We uh, uh, every, it depends on the story. We all got our own uh, perceptions of how 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 many pages a script should be. You know, I, I write screenplays, so it varies depending on what story I tell. You know. Mm-hmm. But I love I love the process of script writing, and 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 for me, whatever the script is, as a director, for some odd reason, I, I just generally run a little bit over a minute a page um, in what winds up in my films. And so I guess it's my sense of pacing or, work, you know, I, I guess pacing is the main reason. And, and so if I get a 100-page script, I, I know pretty well that's going to be like a 100-minute um, film, give mm-hmm. or take. And, and do you apply your theater techniques to filmmaking? Um, I do in terms of, uh, you know, preparing an actor to go on. Um, uh, I had a, a wonderful experience way back when I did Chantilly Lace um, that. in that uh, Talia Shire, who's a, a Francis Coppola's sister, mm-hmm. would tell me that Francis, never seen him direct, would talk and do a performance all the while while the actor was, uh, you know, performing, saying, you know, now you're sad, now you're angry, now you're waiting what you're going to do, and then the actor would emote um, in, in that way, kind of what a director on stage might do at a certain point before, um, you know, uh, the production goes uh, live, you know, during the rehearsals. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've never been quite, I'm a little shy, you know, but I, I've started doing some of that, and it's great fun, and it's uh, it's it gets good results. I, I never before would have thought that. Um, I generally like to know pretty much what I want very clearly, but the first or second takes, I like to give the actors the total freedom to do it the way they're feeling it, because very often they may have something that. Uh, since they're so, by the time we film, they're so immersed in their character, they may have something better than I've even thought of. Mm-hmm. And, and so after um, uh, college was over, did you move to Los Angeles? No. In many ways, I wish I had, Tommy. Um, would have, but I was, again, being very shy. I was pretty young when I got out of school. Um, and... Uh, uh, long story, my parents wanted me to be a doctor, and uh, I was always a good student, so I got into Columbia Presbyterian, and uh, I was uh, there. I hated it so much, and uh, <laughs> a famous lawyer who was lawyer to many important stars and directors like Ilya Kazan and David Merrick from the stage, and Catherine Hepburn, he followed me up to my medical school class, he was a much older man. He said, what are you doing? This is not for you. And I cried and said to my parents, and he said, look, I'm not 100% sure no one can be, but I believe you have a future as a filmmaker, having seen my short and my uh, my film on the Columbia riots. And he said, you should just leave everything. I promise you, you'll have a better career, a better life than if you stay here and do something you don't want. Isn't that amazing? That's an angel. And I saw I've had several angels in my life as I look at them, like the Richard Rogers story and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Feidelson, this man. Oh, I, I envy you. I wish I had an angel like that when I was 18. <laughs> yeah. I had you so know? I had so many people trying to protect me. So many people, I tell you. Wow, that, that's amazing, though. Uh, but your first movie was Looking Up. Well, the first one was the feature was Come Out, Come Out. That was a student film. Mm-hmm. But yes, and then the first real feature was Looking Up. Mm-hmm. It, uh, and that, oh, go ahead. I was just, that was totally scripted. Uh, I, I've learned something about my work that uh, I, I can't, I don't know about other people, but it's very hard for me to tell the difference between my totally scripted movies and my uh, improvised movies. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't you don't want to do an improvised movie for your first movie because the the chances are that the actors you hire are not that good at improvisation. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good advice, and I'm glad I didn't do what you're saying. So, I mean, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, at least you had uh, the legendary Dick Sean in there. Mm. And a lot of extraordinary, good, and famous uh, Broadway actors um, who almost to a person that I chose had been making lots of money doing soap opera. Um, all over New York. New York was the center of soap operas, you know, as the world turns and one life to live and et cetera, et cetera, guiding light. And so uh, they were hungry, even though I was untested, of course, to take a few weeks out, wasn't a very long shoot, and uh, get out of their contracts, basically work for no money, uh, to do looking up. Mm hmm and how did you get funding for the movie? Oh, my God. Well, a life, it, it, until, you know, there was a, a, a run I had in the 80s into the 90s where funding was pretty easy for me. But before then and certainly in, after that, it's a huge struggle. And, <laughs> the, you know, for the first film, I, you know, not really knowing what I was doing, but relying on people who had a little more knowledge, we figured out that we needed $96,000. And um, the uh, it never even occurred to me that you should have a contingency in case you go over budget, you know. Yeah. And uh, the law then is that you could ask for individual investors, but if you had more than 25 investors, uh, or, or maybe it was 30, 25 or 30 investors, uh, you would then have to uh, do filings for the SEC, uh, which costs a lot of money. So I took that 96000 whatever it was, was uh, we, you know, figured out how much a share would be. Uh, I think a share was $3,200. So after that goes into 96, I guess there were 30 mm -hmm. times 30. And then you could either buy a share or a half share and uh, for $1,600. And I pieced together the money that way. Mm -hmm. And this Jonathan Platnick, was he a friend of yours? Yeah, we went to high school t together. And uh, he was, uh, I think, a class or two ahead of me and, and the uh, head writer on the high school paper. And uh, very funny and very smart. And we, we would travel all over the tri-state area as movies opened up to go see them, just to be the first to go see them. Um, so he was another kid who, and his father, funnily enough, had been an atmosphere bit in Hollywood. Now, do you know what that term means, an atmosphere bit? No. It was the euphemism for extra. Oh. So here we have... Here you have, it sounded better than saying you're an extra, you know? And uh, yeah. so you have one kid whose dad was an atmosphere bit and one kid whose mom never got to follow her dream. And, and, and so we both started writing and uh, together and that's how the first film came about. Now, I, I've been an extra in a, in a couple of things. I should uh, call myself um, an atmospheric bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been an extra too. Uh, but isn't it exciting the first time you do it, though? I mean, oh yeah, just just that intensity of being on the set, you know. Um, and every once in a while, though, you run into that one director who's screaming at the extras, and you and, the, and sometimes the other extras are just batshit crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know, it's it's very interesting. I actually was in a, I was interviewed for a documentary about extras a couple of years ago. Oh. Um, I'm waiting for it to come out. Uh, still, uh, uh, the filmmaker's been working on it for like twenty year, plus years now. So, hopefully, it'll finally be over soon. Wow! But it sounds like a good topic for a documentary. Yeah, and you would think that someone would, would already come up with something like this, but no, I mean, I thought that was just a brilliant idea, you know, and, um, you know, I had I had interviewed her 
on uh, this show, and then um, we met up. I got interviewed. You know, she's been back a few times since. So let's hope uh, it'll come out this year. I'd like to see myself on screen, even though I know I'll be really overweight. <laughs> My doctor a couple of weeks ago was so proud of me because I've lost 24 pounds since my uh, last wow. visit. So, yeah. So I got. I, yeah, thank you so much. I got. I got to keep going on the diet because I, I'm just at an age now where I, I shouldn't be overweight anymore. Never a good thing. Never. No. So, so, so how did you go from doing independent films to to working in television? was pre Susan Seidelman, Martha Coolidge, Amy Heckerling, that era of, of women yeah. breaking into mainstream movie directing. I'm, I'm sure it was it, at that time it was tough for you on the theatrical film circuit. Absolutely. And it was still, you know, and again, as you know, from someone who's basically shy and didn't think, um, uh, really that I would, um, uh, have any career in the film business. And then to have this opportunity of the first film. And I, from that, I learned that to be an executive producer at that time, I think it's still true today, in television, was to have the kind of creative control that the director has in film. It's, it, it's a, so that when I made my projects for television as an executive producer, um, I picked the cast. I got the script exactly the way I wanted. I picked the crew and the locations and generally brought the director on uh, a week or two 
before we started filming. So uh, wow. it was a, it's a different existence. Nonetheless, by the time I had done, oh, you know, maybe three years of doing TV movies that way, with me sort of being in the background, some people said it was like the power behind the throne kind of thing. I wanted to be directing and got my opportunity uh, to do a Prisoner Without a Name, Spell Without a Number um, uh, for NBC with the extraordinary opportunity of getting Roy Scheider, who had just won an Academy Award for All That Jazz, mm-hmm. to uh, do his television debut, and Lee Ullman, who was Ingmar Bergman's uh, leading lady in all the great Ingmar Bergman movies. And she asked me about foreign films, and, and you know, she was such a, his films were such a, an influence on me, to make her television debut in, in uh, Prison Without a Name, So Without a Number. Yeah, and you also, yeah. Had, you also had Christopher Murney in that. I did, I did. And uh, I had... Um, Zach Galligan. Zach, who was a big star off of, what was his... Uh, his uh, uh, Gr- Gremlins, yeah. I, I've, I've met him a couple times at uh, conventions. He's an interesting guy. I've lost touch with him. Is he still acting and, and doing his thing? Uh, I believe he is uh, teaching in Atlanta, Georgia, but he does act whenever uh, given the chance. Well, you know, as wonderful as those guys were in the movie, and they were absolutely wonderful, the two... Uh, those days, the network had a lot of approval of your cast, unlike when I did my independent films. I just cast whomever I wanted. And the two young actors who we would read before, who I wanted to use, Kevin Bacon and Matthew Modine, were also pretty amazing choices. And I often think about what might have happened, uh, you know, had they been the ones, you know, to play that part. Yeah. And uh, you uh, worked with um, Anthony Hopkins on Mayflower. Yeah, uh, what a wonderful human being and what a talent. Yeah, did you know he was going to be an Academy Award winner someday? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he had already done The Lion in Winter. I mean, and he was brilliant. Dr. Catherine Hepburn and Peter O'Toole and that. And, uh, uh, yeah, he just, there's some people, it's just a magic you can have all the skills and still not have the magic. And sometimes you can have the magic without having the skill. And if, when you meet someone who has both, um, you know, it's pretty extraordinary. And he is that person. Yeah. When uh, you, you did the royal romance of Charles and Diana, did you ever hear from the real Charles and Diana? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, oh, you know, it, it touches me every time I think about it. Um, I actually became friendly uh, with um, Princess Diana. Um, she interceded. There was a moment in time that uh, it didn't look like the film would go through because uh, the, the royal family, the Charles in particular, was initially against that kind of production. And uh, I actually asked for and, and got an audience with Diana um, was so memorable and she was so fabulous and of course I didn't read anything like there would be any trouble about which way you know uh, their lives would go um, and uh, she interceded and, 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 and convinced Charles that it would be you know a wonderful thing to do and it also helped I mean my partners at the time were a fabulous um, uh, record company um, called Chrysalis, which is still a very important label, and um, the two partners, uh, uh, Chris Wright and Terry Ellis, uh, you know, had, I think, young men with a lot of talent had visions that someday they might be knighted or something, and I think we're afraid if this didn't go smoothly that they would lose the opportunity, but when Diana uh, stepped in, um, you know, we had all sorts of access that was really wonderful. Yeah, oh, what a tragedy, too, you know. 
I could just. I could, in fact, I was uh, to tell you what a tragedy and, and how connected I feel. Um, I was returning from Monaco, where I, uh, uh, in August uh, uh, the year she died, and her boat uh, had been moored just below my hotel room, and they'd been walking around. I never saw her, but I kept you know. And then I flew to Rome, some business, and I didn't understand what was going on on TV. They were actually showing a clip of a movie, and I couldn't understand the Italian. I thought maybe the queen had died, but it was about, unfortunately, about Princess Diana. Yeah, sad. Yeah. How is it that nobody submitted Andy Robinson for an Emmy nomination for Liberace? Uh, well, um, I had the other Liberace. Mm-hmm. You know, there were two dueling Liberaces. I don't think Andy was in mine. Um, really? Uh, huh. Yeah, mine... Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have to say, you know, uh, mine uh, uh, did uh, better than the other. Oh, Victor. Oh, Victor right? Garber. Oh, okay. I, okay, I know now. Yeah, I forgot that Victor Garber played him the same year. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, I had the great joy a number of years back uh, to do a sequel with Victor Garber now playing Prince Charles. So it was just so much fun to, uh, a sequel to um, uh, uh, Royal Romance of Charles and Diana. So three times in my career, uh, I've done this kind of dueling kind of rush to get to the screen uh, activity and I've always felt very supercharged and confident that, you know, we were doing our best work, we, we would uh, prevail and, and, and that, I'm not going to lie, that's happened each of the three times. And the films were Royal Romance of Charles and Diana. There was another one done at the same time. And uh, Liberace and then the sequel to uh, The Royal Romance. Yeah, I, I, I remember just Andy Robinson's. I thought he was brilliant. He should have gotten nominated. I'm sure Victor Garber should have gotten nominated too because he's a brilliant actor. You know, uh, Michael Douglas, of course, won an Emmy for playing Liberace in Behind Behind the Candle Opera, um, mm-hmm. which was a very brutal movie. You know, it's an HBO Steven Soderbergh uh, movie, but um, yeah, I, I, I thought that's very interesting, though. Yeah, people were drawn to that material. Um, yeah, check out Victor Garbus. We had what was so wonderful. Um, uh, we had some, um, uh, who was the actress who played Nurse Ratchet um, Louise, won the Academy Award? Louise Fletcher. Louise, I think, is in it. And uh, it was just a wonderful, I, I, I've been so fortunate to get these sort of ensemble casts of just really great actors that it's been a real treat to work with. And that, that picture has that as well. Yeah, and you teamed up with uh, Nicholas Rogue for a remake of Sweet Bird of Youth. Ah, uh, yeah, how about that? And, uh, oh, the, the late Shirley Knight had uh, played in the original when she was in my movie playing for time. Um, but Elizabeth Taylor, I had, and Tennessee Williams was still alive and was, I was thrilled to work with Tennessee on, on this. It was just a uh, uh, dream come true. Yeah, Mark Harmon is in it. How wonderful. People would say to me, oh, don't cast Mark Harmon. He's, you know, he's just a good-looking face flash. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, and then I said, no, 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 really. He's, uh, you know. And uh, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, mm. I love Elizabeth Taylor. She was such a, you know, I'd known her for many years, but she hadn't remembered when we first met. Um, you know, just that I had spent time with her like 15 years earlier. And, um, but she, and she was very good with, she was on the set, she learned her lines and everything, but every day there was a, a bet on set, E.T., E.T., E.T. 
And I, <laughs> they asked me, this, you know, the crew, and, and one day they asked me, do I want to be part of it? And I didn't know what it was. And it was a bet based on the exact time it was the Taylor Exits trailer. <laughs> 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 Because it never quite was the time she was supposed to. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> so did you did you find producing uh, more exciting than directing? No, quite the opposite. Um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it has to. You, you know, uh, by the way, that's one of my frustrations with this terrible little plague that we're in. People say, you know... Um, take one day at a time. And my nature is such that I like to plan way ahead. It made me a good producer, a very good producer. You have to have contingencies for everything. Um, of course, today it's very hard to do that. But after doing producing for a number of years, I um, could have been handling, I was in a position where I could have been you know, dealing with five or ten movies a year easily because they sort of wanted my product. But it made me feel like, you know, those uh, uh, in circuses, there's always some guy who has like three sticks and he's keeping plates spinning alive as he moves from stick to stick. Did yeah. you ever see that? Yeah. Circus? Yeah. I felt that way because I was not getting as intimately involved as when you're direct. When you're direct, also there's that contact with the actors that's just so magical and so suited my personality um, mm -hmm. and uh, working, collaborating. Not all directors are great collaborators, but, but I think I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just talking to you now, I mean, I can see you're, pre you're, you're pretty easy to get along with. Yeah, I am. I am. But and so, you know, I think every time one gets to make a movie, it's a miracle. You know? Yeah. A miracle. I, I tell people all the time, I say, you know, movie making is a gift. Not everybody gets to do that, you know, and I get so angry when I talk to actors who are just bitter and negative and not appreciative of the cult success they have with certain movies because they wanted to be a huge A-list star. You know, they just don't see the gift that they got to do something that's 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 good like that, you know, making a, a, a film. I mean, yeah, it was a little film or something, but it it gave them, you know, that kind of level of notoriety. I couldn't agree with you more. Right on, you know? Mm -hmm. and, 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 but there are only some famous, uh, oh, some great famous British actor, I'm going to say someone like David Niven or something, said there aren't little parts, there are only little people, you know? So that you can get a very small part as an actor and, and make the most of it and make it something that people will never forget. And I feel uh, yeah, lately uh, I've, I've been attached to some very large movies, but lately my own projects have been small independent projects, and, and I just feel the same way about that as we talk about actors. Yeah, oh, I've had some very interesting cases on here, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of them, but uh, the first. You should write a book about it. Huh? You should write a book. I, I yeah, I, I, there's so many books in me I want to write. It's just that mm. I'm just you know so busy doing this show and everything that I'm, I'm so dedicated to this now and stuff, you know. But I do have you know books in mind that I want to do, you know. Of course, about things that, that have happened to me, like, you know, five years ago, I had a car accident, and that's the, the reason why I do this podcast now, because it made me see things differently than I did before. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. but something good came out of it. I'm so sorry you had that. Yeah, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, I have to say. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, but wow. there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff there, I have to say. But, the, yeah, the first movie of yours I remember seeing, of course, is the aforementioned Chantilly Lace on Showtime. Um, where did this great movie come from? Oh, well, you know, I was uh, nearing 40, and I was uh, feeling um, uh, that maybe the industry was more designed 
for younger people, yeah. younger women. And um, I went to uh, a cocktail party and met Jo Beth Williams for the first time. And we just had a, and her husband, terrific director named John Pasquin. Right. And we just had that conversation that went on and on. And I found that she, who I admired so much her work, she was feeling the same way about turning 40. Um, and uh, we then, in sort of in short uh, sequence after that, I met, you know, in di- under different circumstances, I met um, uh, Lindsay Krauss and uh, Natalia Shire. I was living out in LA then, I'm living in New York now. And um, everybody, all, all the women were feeling the same way. And, uh, but I still didn't know what to do about it. Um, and uh, I didn't know Robert Redford, but I heard about the Sundance um, Film Festival. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, another woman uh, who was part of that group convinced me to write. And so when I came up with an idea, I thought, you know, I'd gotten. By the time I was ready to write them, I had these seven women who were interested to go to a workshop with me, and they were all pretty, you know, substantial stars uh, in their own right at that moment in time. And we wanted to play around with the idea of a group of seven women friends over a period of um, a year and three times. So we meet up three times, and. Uh, I wrote a treatment, and it was accepted, but a friend of mine who was Faye Datton, who had this, uh, it's still a very powerful agency for more below the line people, you know, but like cinematographers and editors and production designers, she said, you can't, you have these women, and, 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 and you know, digital cameras didn't exist then, you know, it just... Mm-hmm. He said, shoot on your phone or anything. She said, I will help you get a crew, but you just can't let this thing, because the way most people, they would go to the workshop and sort of work it out, never film it, and then go and try to raise the money to do it uh, at a later time. And uh, she said, I'll help you get a crew, um, but, uh, you know, you have to come up with some money. You'll, you'll have to pay for film, and I guess housing or whatever else. So I scrambled, like I had done with that first movie, and used my credit cards, and we all went off to Sundance for what was supposed to be a week of playing around, but I filmed everything that we did. And uh, we, we talked about the subjects and acted the subjects that were important to us as women at that time, and then that's how that came about. Wow. It's a editing. Yeah. Imagine. And then when we had a few uh, scenes that I thought were quite remarkable, I called Showtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, they came and watched it. Um, Steve Hewitt, who was the head then. And they just loved it. They just loved it. And they helped us finish it. And then, much to my delight, um, the Sundance was going to do a fundraiser featuring uh, a very big movie um, uh, by some of their uh, Sundance uh, trustees, you know, mm-hmm. the Hollywood movie. And the movie was uh, an all-star disappointment. And Robert Redford, to his credit, said, I don't want to show this movie to raise money for Sundance. It doesn't represent Sundance. And uh, uh, the two women who were uh, working with him, Michelle Sava and uh, Nicole Gionne, said, well, we just saw a film, you know, that you have to see. And that's how that happened. And it became the, uh, sort of the hit, Sundance hit that year. Wow. Is, is there any influence of the big chill in it? Well, I think I was influenced. That's really great. Yeah, I, I think I was influenced by that. I was certainly influenced by uh, a movie from the 40s, I believe, it was called The Women, the Claire Bufus movie, which was all women. Um, do you know that movie? Oh, 
I'm sorry. What was it called again? The women. The women. Uh, I know three women. The Robert Altman movie. Right. So the women is really worth checking out, and then uh, it's a uh, 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 Claire Booth Luce wrote it, and uh, it, it's a world without men. Yeah, I think you never see men in that movie. So that was something that we see part body parts of the Pizza Boy in, in Chantilly, but but it was kind of no holds barred, and and, and what. Uh, women and, and men felt about the movie. It was like kind of a peek into you know, the world where women could be totally honest and, and uh, you know, express who they are. And, yeah. Um, I just learned something I was watching uh, last night, uh, uh, Mrs. America, the Kate Blanchett show. I don't know if you've seen it on, um, uh, I think it's Hulu um, or Amazon. Amazon. And yeah, yeah, I didn't realize that the, the ERA amendment was never, ever passed. Mm -hmm. Women have never, there's never been, you know, ratified that women should get equal pay or do anything like that. But, of course, uh, Chantilly was like 26, 27 years ago, and it dealt with a lot of subjects that, had, you know, are a little more commonplace now, but they're still, still the kind of things that women talk about. Yeah, I mean, at the time, you know, uh, when I was watching it, you know, I didn't have a, a full appreciation of what it was about. You know, to me, you know, I was going through puberty at the time, and I just thought it was great because all these beautiful women were all together talking dirty and stuff, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> but all the actresses, you know, I mean, even I knew it at, at that age, all these actresses were just so great, you know, and I'd seen them in all the other things that they had done, you know. And I just loved, I, I love that element of it. Now, you know, I, I, that I'm older, I have more appreciation for it. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. I'm very proud of that uh, movie. And of course, it brought me back to directing. Um, when we were doing it, and some of it was improvisational, Robert Redford would visit us on the set during those some seven days. And he, he brought me inside one day. He said, you may be the most spiritual director I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, I was uh, uh, so convinced that it will sort of work out. And I'll tell you a little secret. It's not, it was written about the time, but it's absolutely true. Um, we had what was going to happen in the first uh, two acts. In the third act, which I don't know if I want you to give away to your audience or not, but you know that there's a death that takes place. And yeah. um, we actually stopped our filming when I had completed Act 1 Act 2 and then had them draw straws. I still have this on film that shows that it was real and everything, and they drew straws as to who was going to die. And I was so convinced. I think what I was grappling with at that point in my life um, I hadn't lost anybody really close to me then, you know, yeah. I was afraid it would happen um, and in terms of people my age. And it's like in any group, someone is going to be the first to die. And in any group, you don't know who's going to live and who's not, who, who won't. It's kind of like intensified on testosterone now with, uh, with the, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, so we, Every moment is precious, but we always forget that. And, and that was in the underpinnings of, of Chantilly. Mm -hmm. And that was um, so successful that uh, you got to do parallel lives for Showtime? Wow, absolutely, yeah. People said, oh, we want to see now. You've done it with women, and you do it with men. I said, well, I can do it with men and men and women. And so the original cast came back, and all of these... I mean, have you ever seen the uh, poster for Chantilly? I've read the Parallel Lives. It is. Yeah. You as a film buff, you know, it's like 22 stars all yeah. together. It's kind of like the old days of MGM. They used to gather all the stars for a close-up. Yeah. And this was for, for that movie. And I'm, I'm smack in the middle somewhere on the upper row uh, between, I think, Paul Servino and, uh, um, and, uh, and James Brolin. I'll send it to you if you, haven't, uh, if you don't have that. Oh, 
Oh, sure, that'd be great. Yeah, it, it, it seems like in those days, uh, Showtime was a lot more art house than HBO. But then after The Sopranos hit, you know, HBO became more art house just as much as Showtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think you're right. Well, again, uh, Showtime was a little bit more fledgling, you know, and yeah. so they had to uh, uh, sort of uh, do something that HBO wasn't doing to get the attention. And they were great. They were so wonderful uh, to work with. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, my most recent film that's out, Fluidity, um, was sold to Showtime. Um, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but it's running, streaming, and running out. I haven't seen it yet, but I've uh, re- read some good reviews on it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But in, in parallel lives, though, um, I, that must have been just uh, it must have been just awestruck to like work with guys like uh, Jim Belushi and Paul Servino and Dudley Moore and then Liza Minnelli and, and uh, Ben Gazzara and Jenna Rollins, still one of my greatest friends in the world, and uh, um, yeah, and rather you know yada 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 on and on, um, and Dudley Moore. I mean, yeah, I would look around the set. We took over an army base that had been closed but looked a lot like the college campus that you see on screen. And we just took it over, and there was some crummy hotel uh, just off of the base where we all stayed. Um, And the other thing in common would be small movies that I've done. The longest schedule I've ever had was, I think, 13 or 14 days, 13 days. Um, Chantilly Race was done in six. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's nonstop work and nonstop filming, and I film with two cameras to make the editing easier. But in every corner, it was lovely time of year. It must have been, like, late spring, and... Uh, in every corner, the actors who had upcoming scenes were working with the other actors um, so diligently and so involved because they're going to be up next and they want to be prepared. It was great. Yeah. Was Paul Servino pop- problematic at all? No one was problematic. Um, it was just, if anybody started to get a little bit out of line, Mm-hmm. The, some, the other actors, not me, it was a bit of a delight because there's so many great heavyweight actors who would like embarrass them to be back in line. So it was just, <laughs> it was terrific that way. Uh, it's a, a once in a lifetime experience in that regard. I, I met Paul Servino a couple of years ago at a convention. And, you know, he had that, that, that gruffness about him. And I interviewed uh, this one actress, and she said, Paul Servino is the world's greatest actor, according to Paul Servino. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, I think, he, you know, he has a, you know, a very, and his daughter was in this movie, too. It was her very first role, not in Mighty Aphrodite, but uh-huh. this was very similar role to what she plays in Mighty Aphrodite. And I actually, she, she's a very, was a very smart Radcliffe College graduate who in person didn't look like she could do either my role or Mighty Aphrodite. And I actually sent uh, Woody Allen some footage from my film to help him be able to see that she could uh, play that part in Mighty Aphrodite, which got an Academy Award. Um, yeah. But so Paul would... Uh, uh, well, also, um, uh, it is, a, is a, an opera buff. You probably heard the story. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> the crummy hotel we were in had uh, like a, a central courtyard that all the rooms were around. Yeah. You know? And so he would wake up in the morning, and the central courtyard gave an opportunity for enormous echoes of his voice. So instead of, you know, uh, uh, the alarm clock or a uh, rooster, we will be awakened to uh, Paul uh, singing an aria. It's <laughs> kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I told him, I said, you know, 
uh, I love what your daughter is doing for women's rights. And he was very appreciative of that. And that same actor who said that, she was like, oh, please, he's the biggest misogynist there is. <laughs> Simeon line come from? Oh, well, if you open your hand, right? Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I hope this is all. I only have about 10 minutes because I have to work with Diana before she leaves at the end of the week. But, oh, yeah, I'm almost um, finished. You know, our hands have a, 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 a lifeline that's the long line that sort of goes from your wrist up. Yes. Right? And then it's the connection there's next to it is a, a, a heart line. Mm -hmm. And then um, parallel to it, most people, there's a, a headline. So the heart and head is separated. But for people, a very small percentage of people, um, less than, I think, 10%, uh, much less, maybe so like 2%, they do not have a separated heart and headline. And when the two lines are joined, it's called the simian line. And it's told those people have a bigger problem separating their heart from their head. And um, interestingly enough, people who have two simian lines, one on each hand, um, are always um, uh, 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 down syndrome. One mm -hmm. of the things they tell if a kid. Anyway, that story, that I had a young man who worked for me who was very charming and very good-looking and sociable. And he was the one who told me the story of the Simeon line. And uh, he had it. And uh, I was at a point in my life then, I had just moved back from uh, California, ending a long-term relationship uh, with an actor. And I questioned relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, so that became the perfect metaphor, you know, to do, that, to do the Simeon line. With another great all star kit, um, and again, an improvised movie. Mm -hmm. I've, I've interviewed Samantha Mathis. Uh, she's an interesting woman. Mm -hmm. She was quite young then. I, I loved her. She was great, and she played a ghost. And mm -hmm. her love interest was another ghost played by William Hurt, um, who most people, again, outside of my experience with him, which was wonderful, but some people can say he's difficult, but. That was not my experience at all. Yeah. It also, Tyne Daly and Monica Kina, a very talented cast. Um, yeah, Cindy Crawford, Eric Stoltz, uh, yeah, uh, Lynn Redgrave. Um, I would never think I would never think to cast Cindy Crawford. Where'd that come from? Well, you know, I, I, I've had cast in many of my movies and friends with some of the most beautiful actresses in Hollywood, and people often don't think they can act because they're so beautiful. Yeah. And uh, Cindy did uh, some big budget uh, action movie uh, with um, uh, uh, William Baldwin, uh, uh, Alec Baldwin's brother. Yeah. And uh, I think they're both talented actors, and I saw in the picture that everyone was just saying, oh, terrible. it's so easy to, to knock. Uh, somebody, you know, who, uh, and and so um, I got to speak with her and explain to her that uh, that even though she was a new new actor, new to acting, that with the right director to bring out and cast in the right role, um, that I was quite confident that she would give a terrific performance, and she did. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's good that you did that, though. Yeah, and and she she loved doing it, and uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen her in it. Uh, she plays Jamie Sher Sheridan's trophy wife, so it was a role that you know she would 
and you stand and then married to an older man too and she had been married to Richard Gere. She had been divorced him for a number of years, but uh, so she was able to draw on her own life experience, which, you know, the best actors do in their invariably. Oh yeah, I remember that. That was a, a huge hugely publicized event <laughs> which she was buried the Richard Gear. Yes, yes. Can I answer anything or I can certainly if you have any other questions I can come at another time, but I just got to get back to Diana before the um, Yeah we've been on like yeah. over an hour. Is there anything else you you want to know in wrapping up? Oh yes, in in wrapping up, uh, you mentioned an email uh, that you have another movie you worked on, but you don't know uh, when um, it's going to come out and stuff. But uh, are you done um, editing the movie? No, that's why I can't talk about it. We, it's a movie I shot in December mm-hmm. and felt very thrilled about it. I, I never, I'm, I'm someone who doesn't like the cold, and I, <laughs> I, I filmed it in, in like one of the coldest places that I've ever been. Uh, we were like, the wind shows, it was like minus 20 at some times. And um, I can't tell you anything about it other than we're struggling right now with the editing process because we're doing it via Zoom, Mm -hmm. and it's so hard to do it. Um, And it's another improvised film, and um, uh, with an all-star cast. And I will be so you know. So I have no idea. Just like we don't know when this madness will end, this global madness. Um, I have no idea when we. Through editing, uh, but we're making progress. We, literally, this week was the first time I looked at it and thought, "Wow, it's really just starting to come together." Uh, but the one thing about improvised movies, you can shoot them quickly, as I've done and had to do. But it takes a long time in the editing room, and not being close to an editor and working with an editor for the first time this way, without a script for him to follow, is pretty challenging. But we're doing it. Oh, that's good. Yes. Um, and, you know, like I said, you're always welcome to come back on to talk about it when um, it does get released. And uh, all we got to do is stay strong. And, you know, we're, I know that you know, this, this country is going to make it. Everything's going to be great. You know, it's already starting to. I mean, places are starting to open up again. Well, that scares me a little bit because because of the wisdom of age. Just be patient. Right. You know? We have to, to stay strong. We need to be patient and be aware and be conscious of each other. You know, this is one of the rare times. Uh, I'll just conclude with saying one of the most important movies I ever did was Playing for Time. And it was an unusual story about the Holocaust, but because most Holocaust stories about whether one person will live or die. This was about an orchestra in the Holocaust, or a woman's orchestra, that in order to stay alive and and not all be killed, they all had to stay alive. So sometimes they'd have to take food out of their own mouths to give it to somebody else to be able to live. Um, And I think this pandemic is a little bit like that. We we can't be selfish in any way, and we have to realize when when we wear our masks and we social distance, it's not just about us, but it's about the other person. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Linda. You, it's, you know, how life reflects art. Sometimes art is about reflecting life, and life can also reflect art. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, Tommy. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person someday, but um, feel free if you need anything else, and, uh, you know, onward and upward. Oh, absolutely, Linda, and thank you so much for coming on today. Stay safe, take care, good care of yourself. You know, uh, do what you can with that movie you're you're finishing, and happy Mother's Day. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, Linda Yellen. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a very nice lady and very humble, and has some great stuff there about filmmaking, great knowledge about filmmaking, and great stories about working with people. I liked her a lot. I'd like to have her back on. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. 
Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.